Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Onstage Blog Theater Podcast. And we're so excited today. We are having an interview with a composer and uh, and lyricist Paul Gordon is with us. He has been the man behind uh, some wonderful shows, including Jane Eyre and Emma, and of course, Daddy Longlegs, which is a favorite of mine. And uh, Paul, thank you so much for coming on talking with us. I'm happy to be here, Rachel. Yeah. So since this is your first time on the podcast, we just like to get a chance to get to know you a little bit better. And so why don't you introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about how how you got started? How did you get inspired to get into uh, the world of uh, musicals, writing musicals? Yeah, well, I mean, my parents had a big influence on me. Um, I grew up to them listening to South Pacific and West Side Story and My Fair Lady and Guys and Tolls and sort of all the great golden age musicals. Uh So my ear was already perked at a young age. And, you know, whereas I I gravitated more towards the Beatles and pop music when I was a kid and growing up. And somehow that combination of music, I feel like has shaped me. And, um, and yeah, and, and, I was I was a pretty successful pop songwriter for a long time and had some hits and so forth. But my heart was always in musical theater. And I'd only written one show. Um, and it was a rock musical called Backstreet. And then it was called Greetings to Venice Beach. And we had a lot of fun people in it. Um, Pamela Adlon, who uh, oh. television audiences will know. Katie Segal, uh-huh. who television audiences will know. And uh, yeah, a lot of people got their their start in that show. And it was probably like, it was a very Rent-like show about 10 years before Rent. But we did it in LA and we had no theater connections. So I was just sort of muddling along with my my pop music career um, until I saw Les Mis. And then I went, I wonder if I could adapt a classic novel into a musical. That was just my thought, just as an exercise. And that's when I, you know, came across Jane Eyre and and started to musicalize that on my own, having no connections to Broadway, New York City, anything. I was living in Los Angeles, essentially a pop songwriter, living in Laurel Canyon. And oh wow. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wrote this musical and I used one of my pop singers, Sally Dworsky who is pretty well known um, at the time. She was Don Henley's background singer. She was an amazing singer. And so I would, you know, we were working together as as creatives, but somehow she she nabbed the understudy to Eponine in the LA Touring Company of Les Mis. So, which is the first time I saw the show, which I didn't like the show at all. Oh, really? Interesting. Didn't care for it. And, but I remember thinking, I was so visually amazed and thrilled. I wasn't thrilled with the show, but I was filled. I was thrilled. And I literally said to myself, if I could only work with these people on one of my shows. And amazingly, 10 years later, I was on Broadway with the costume designer, the director, and the scenic designer. So that was weird in itself. So, but Sally was in the show. And then I had another friend who was understudying Fontaine. So I had to go back to see her. And it was the second time I saw the show that I got it. It was just like, Ah. I just needed to hear that music again. It sounded, it sounded a little too generic to me the first time. And of Uh course, still have a problem with a lot of the recessive of Les Mis. But I now find the main songs gorgeous and beautiful and work brilliantly most of them although i still give john carrot a hard time about les mis and how it should be shorter and <laughs> why aren't people speaking why are you singing everything anyway <laughs> well i mean every broadway musical should be shorter yes yes and, <laughs> I, I'm, and we're going to talk about Number that six, that's Longlegs. the only one <laughs> yeah we're going to talk about that in a minute with daddy long legs too because i have something yeah. to- that but anyway so my introduction is just that um then from there when i made the demo of 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 jane Eyre using some of the cast of the la company of les mis um that's how i was introduced to john carrot and and then that's how 
I, as a pop songwriter living in Los Angeles, became a Broadway composer. And, you know, it's so funny, like some of the, you know, there's so much great advice that people will give you. Like I, I sometimes read social media threads, like what's the best advice you've ever received? And I read these threads and it's like, everything is great. Like everything makes sense. But the yeah. one that caught my attention a few years ago was one that was a, was a, a piece of advice that said, it's not what you do, it's who you know. And I recognize that I'm very fortunate that there's a lot of people as talented as me, but uh -huh. um, like I knew John Caird, I met John Caird and he got me, he recognized me and that's why I'm here. And, and, I, and I just so appreciate, sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's just you're walking around a corner, you know, it's the classic movie sliding doors where, you know, if you turned right, this would happen to you. If you turned left, this would happen to you. So who knows? Yeah. But I'm very grateful for um, for the people that I've gotten to work with and that have, you know, put me here. Well, so much of success in life is about saying yes. You know, yes. They take advantage of the the next project and the next project. And you might, uh, in, in keeping those connections, like you said, exactly. uh, uh, alive and uh, and nourishing the relationships too that you meet along the way that's right and not yeah. be precious about things you yeah know, absolutely too, like you know not being too in love with your own material that it's that when somebody comes uh, comes at you with a new idea you're in a uh -huh. position to go, oh i'm open to that instead right. of no being humble yeah yeah i think that's true yeah, thank you. yeah so i noticed that all of your uh your main musicals are all based on classic novels. So I was just curious, are you, would you say you're a big reader? Uh, you know, it's that great scene, a uh, great moment in the book of Pride and Prejudice where um, Miss Bingley accuses <laughs> um, Elizabeth of being a great reader, you know, cause she's sitting there with a book and she, and she looks at her and goes, I am not a great reader. Yeah. And that's how I feel. I relate to Elizabeth Bennett. Right. Um, I was a much better reader. My wife is a great reader. But, you know, I'll just be honest with you and, you know, and the people listening to this podcast is just that, you know, I grew up on television uh -huh. and I'm very visual and I'm and I, you know, I'm an impatient reader. Um, so when I have musicalized these novels, yes, I've read them. But that was a lot of work for me. You know, the reason that I knew about Emma was from the movie, um, the Gwyneth Paltrow movie. Uh -huh. And I watched the movie, you know, like a month before I started writing the musical. I'd watched it again because I'd seen it when it came out. And I just watched the movie and went, this would make an unbelievable musical. Why has nobody made this into a musical? Then I read the novel and went, oh, my God, Jane Austen. Who knew? And um, so, you know, I fell in love with Jane Austen, fell in love with with her, you know, Little indie author. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and yeah, so I I struggle with that part of it, you know, because you have to you have to read these novels and know them so well in order to write these pieces. So I do. But I am not a great reader. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, what do you think makes for what do you think makes a story great for a musical? That's a great question. So I think the biggest, um, the biggest challenge I think people have in creating musicals is source material. And I feel the, the biggest mistake producers, directors, uh, you know, artists that want to create musicals don't understand they don't ask the question, do these characters sing? Now, mm. that's completely subjective, right? It's just my opinion yeah. of these characters sing, these characters do not sing. And it's been my observation that a lot of our recent musicals uh, involve a lot, uh, you know, especially our movie musicals, which is a whole other subject. Um, you know, they don't create arenas or environments in which people would naturally sing. They can sing. You can write a song for them 
and they can be in that familiar movie that you loved as a kid or or a novel or story but that doesn't mean that it works so what i look for is well first of all like you know jane austen charles dickens um you know charlotte bronte uh gene webster any of these classic writers generally create an arena in which characters could sing if you gravitate towards that story yeah what is much more difficult is creating modern stories where people sing yeah. you know why did hamilton work great for the people that it worked for is because they were in 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 essence you know telling the story in a very modern way um you know the music was modern but the characters were not right so those characters, mm. you know, to me sang like that was a great arena for character uh -huh. thing. Even though the music and the language was modern, um, it still felt believable. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you know, I will just take the movie of, you know, maybe In the Heights or some of those other movies done by incredibly talented people. But whereas the stage show of In the Heights, I thought everybody sang and I thought everybody mm. the world in which right. the movies generally do not create that world because they don't know how they are not. They're not created by people that live and breathe musical theater in their blood and know mm -hmm. the form. they don't know the form. And that's why every movie musical, in my opinion, has been bad other than Chicago, which was genius. Mm -hmm. And because Rob Marshall, at least in that film, understood exactly why people sang. And that was the greatest arena for people to sing. It was all in her mind. It was all in a club setting. It was gorgeous. Huh. It all worked. But you I know, think it's a really, really interesting movie. point, because if you think about like some of the some of the screen to stage adaptations that have worked, like Hairspray, for instance, it totally makes sense. Those characters sing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in, they're in a world that sings. So period pieces generally will work, but certainly contemporary pieces work um, when they're when they're done well. Uh -huh. And and um, for me, I do love contemporary musicals, and I write many of them. So uh -huh. my one of my musicals behind us is Analog and Vinyl, about you know two two young people in a vinyl record store with one customer who may or may not be Satan. And, you know, yeah. that was a fun environment to write a musical about, you know, uh, sort of the music that I grew up to, like the great pop music of the 60s and the 70s. And, you know, a guy that I relate to that like works in the store and misses vinyl is, you know, not into this new digital age. And, you know, a woman there that's the love interest who's all digital. And that was a fun story to create. And I think I created it in an environment in which I allowed people to sing. Um, but that's the key, huh. I think, for yeah. why some musicals sing and why, why some source material works and some doesn't. But of course, it's all subjective to each of us as an audience. And what I think is that the our most recent audiences are growing up to a different caliber of musical that maybe some of us grew up to the, the standards are different like i will notice that you know there was a time where most musical theater writers sounded more like stephen sondheim than jonathan larson musically mm -hmm. and that was interesting so I think there's a lot of stuff happening right now. I think there's a lot of people that are excited for the form, but very yeah. few people that have mastered it. Mm. Well, there's just so much content now. It's just, I mean, it just seems like every every day there's a new musical opening up on Broadway or off yeah. Broadway. I mean, there's it's it's really. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's like, usually you know, and and right now it's usually. Uh, kind of a middle-aged producer going i loved this movie yeah the, based on a movie awesome. yeah <laughs> that, that, and they have no concept of what actually works and what doesn't work and of course if you pick the right movie it doesn't matter like if you yeah. pick the right movie then it's they're going to be the husbands of the wives that are dragging them to broadway <laughs> the broadway show that are going to go well i'll see yeah. that i liked the movie and there you go yeah that's true. That's true. Well, so for uh, for Daddy Long Legs, it, it's not as famous a novel mm. as Jane Eyre or Emma. 
So how did that end up happening? How did you end up uh, coming yeah, to that Yeah, that's project? a great question. So John Caird is um, married to this fabulous Japanese woman, Malko Caird. And Malko grew up in Japan. And Daddy Longlegs is a very famous novel in Japan. Oh, okay. Not here, but it is there. So uh -huh. um, when John and Malko got married, I think kind of, I want to say like, you know, I don't think we we weren't at brought in on Broadway yet. I don't think. Um, I think we had done La Jolla, um, but Malco just said this should be your next musical. Read this book. John read the read the book. You know, in an hour, and um, you know, called me up and said, "I think this is our next musical." And send you know, this is before, I think before books were on on the internet. I think I think he mailed me the novel. You know, I was just like, okay, whatever. I've never heard of it. Um, I, I I read the novel, you know, with it, like you do in an hour or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's I a loved, quick read. I loved it. I loved yeah. the tone. I loved the language. I loved uh -huh. the simplicity of the story. And I was just like, oh, my God. Uh, it, like, unlike Jane Eyre, where, you know, it took me couple of weeks to go through that novel and make all the notes. And I wouldn't allow myself to write any music until I finished the novel. Uh -huh. This, obviously, I finished it very quickly. And I just started writing. And I wrote the first five songs, I think, in three days. It oh was those. Yeah, it was the opening. It was, I know it was like other girls. It was things I didn't know. It was like some uh -huh. of my favorite songs in the show. Yeah. I wrote very, very quickly. And I, I just wanted to like capture the tone of the book instantly because I, I I felt I understood it, and um and so I sent so like a few days later I send these like five songs to John, and he's kind of blown away. He's just like, what? How did you know? And um so he was like so enamored with what I was doing. However, my first draft, and I insisted on this, was a one woman show. I didn't oh, want interesting. You know, I didn't think we needed him. I thought she was so interesting. I love the narrative device. So I wrote the first draft. You know, usually when I write a show with John, I write the first draft book and music and lyrics, and then he changes everything. Uh -huh. um, so I wrote the whole show. And, you know, he was like, man, I think we need Jervy. Um, and I, no, we don't need Jervy. Like we could do this anywhere. We could do it in a club. We could do it on stage anywhere. Like it would just be great. It's so simple. You know, Jane Eyre was so huge and this feels so good. It's just one woman. So we worked on that for a little while. You know, I don't, I don't know if it was a year or two years uh -huh. or however long he wow. allowed to do it. But I remember like him looking at me going, we got to have Jervy. I went, Okay. But we didn't know how Jervy functioned in the piece. So we started working with David Parsons, who is a choreographer, very famous choreographer in New York, uh, has a company called the David Parsons Company. And he's just genius. So we found ourselves in Florida doing this workshop of Daddy Longlegs, a very early draft with David Parsons and his nine dancers and an actor playing Jervy who almost didn't have anything to do because we didn't know who Jervy was yet. And a woman named Jane Patterson, who was uh, Marla Schaffel's understudy um, on Broadway, was our Jerusha. And she was so unbelievable. And I wish the world could, I wish we could have done the show <laughs> when Jane was still of age of the show. Yeah. Because um, she was so good. And, and obviously Megan is great too, but Jane was just like the first one that did it and amazing. Mm -hmm way but we and and even though this workshop was unbelievable like the dancers would be you know everything from the farm animals to a lampshade to a chair to other characters to sally mcbride uh -huh. and it was so creative and inventive it looked so amazing but this whole workshop we only worked on like three or four songs where they david and john staged them brilliantly we had Broadway producers come to see what we did. And I kept looking at John and David and going, this looks great, but what's the show? 
what is the show? We don't have a show yet. And sure enough, all these people came. It looked brilliant, but they went, what's the show? Yeah. We didn't have a show to show them. And then we went back to the drawing board. And I remember John and I having this meal where we were both very depressed because we just, I remember him looked at me and goes, I just don't know how to make the show work. And we just looked at each other and we go, I, I know we'll figure it out. I know we'll figure it out. And then I guess it was maybe about a month later where John had the first version of the show where he wrote Jervie's voice. And it was brilliant. It was like, it was, it, it hit for me exactly the way Gene Webster, Webster's Jerusha voice hit for me. He hit it with Jervie. And of course, there, there is no Jervy voice in the novel, clearly, other than a right. few of her re remembering things he said. Um, and, and once he started doing these monologues, I went, all right, this is no longer a monologue. This is a song. And then I was able to write songs for Jervy for the first time that made sense in the show. And then we have a show. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I, I think that that's what makes the, the show really stand out is because it's just, just, I, I haven't seen that many musicals with just two people and to, to just Nearby. dive into their characters and become so attached to yeah. who they are. It's really special. I mean, it, thank you, Rachel. You know, it's so wild because I, I guess anybody seeing Daddy Longs go, oh, this is so simple and so easy. If people really oh, no. know how we struggled <laughs> to get I'm here sure. and how many wrong turns we made is unbelievable. Yeah. How well, many this could have gone wrong? It's interesting too because we really had like a dearth of romances on Broadway. I mean, I, I think with like with Hamilton and with uh, Dear Evan Hansen and things like that, we've had a lot of you know other kinds of stories, um, yep. but we haven't really had. I mean, so I'm excited to see like the Notebook being a pretty. I think it's done pretty well, and uh, um, I'd like to see a return of romances back on the uh, so would on I. the Broadway stage. Well, I know that, you know, I have a couple of people working on Pride and Prejudice Broadway. Ah. I know that I'm I'm very interested in um, some off-Broadway productions of Sense and Sensibility and Emma. Uh -huh. I mean, I think, you know, New York is ready for Jane Austen. And yeah, yeah I, I mean, all of my stories have romance, even my modern stories, because I'm a romantic. Yeah, yeah. And, and those are the stories that I, I want to see. I write what I want to uh -huh. see. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how else to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, was it hard also like building the chemistry between two characters who never actually, well, no, they do <clears throat> meet like other things, but they don't meet much. Uh, they... Surprisingly, surprisingly, no. Yeah. Yeah. You know I mean, because they're obviously you go through a rehearsal process and, you know, the actors, you know, are friends and, you know, uh -huh. they're married to each other or in the case of, Megan and Rob Hancock, who was doing it all those years before we got to you off Broadway, they were uh -huh. great friends. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, I think, you know, I mean, obviously chemistry might not happen between right. us, but yeah. I think with this show, because they're the proximity on stage and, you know, they might as well be speaking to each other and they are speaking to each other. They're just not necessarily looking uh -huh. at, each other, which is challenging, but you know, that's why John Carrot's genius made that show work so well. Yeah, yeah. Because he knew how to stage it yeah. so that we feel like they're always together. Yeah. I mean, I th think with Daddy Longings, like some people will, will be thinking about the, the Fred Astaire movie. Ugh. And like, this is so much better than that movie. And well, I, I like all of the things you did to like modernize it and update it. So he's not old. Yes. <laughs> I mean, listen. We had a couple of critics actually do two paragraphs <laughs> on the Fred Astaire movie before they mentioned our show. Oh, no. It was clear from that they didn't get it. Uh -huh. And it was just like, well, as you know, if you've ever seen that movie, it has zero to do with the novel. It's not the novel. Yeah. They just took one kind of premise of it and bastardized it in a horrible way. And, no chemistry at all because he's so much older than her. Well, I mean, not only that, but it's the opposite of what Gene Webster wrote. He sees a pretty girl and goes, ooh, I'm going to pretend to be her teacher so I can date her. Right. Like, 
that is the opposite of this. Yeah. <laughs> it is literally like, no, that's not the <laughs> story at all. He falls yeah. in love with her mind and then yeah. meets her and continues to be in love with her. Right. Yeah, oh. absolutely. Yeah. Well, what advice would you give to like young aspiring composers and uh, lyricists? Um, it's not what you do. It's who you know. So try to meet people. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, and then it's what you do. Um, work on your craft. But the best thing I can say, the other great life lesson, I think, is just perseverance. Is just don't give up. The people that are eventually successful, and they, and successful can mean many things. Successful can mean, I'm a billionaire. I have 10 shows on Broadway. Or, you know what? My, my work is getting produced in this local theater. And that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, so it, it is really just not giving up, Rachel. It's just don't quit because as an artist, you know, you will be discouraged way more times than you will be encouraged. So you have to have that inner voice that says, I can't, I don't know how to do anything else. I can't do anything else other than my survival job, which I'm going to continue to do. Um, but I have to do this and I'm going to keep doing it till the day I die. And I'm going to stay positive about it. And I'm going to keep reaching out to people I don't know and just keep, you know, just keep doing it. Just keep yeah. like at it every day. Even if I think I'm like, I think my worst skill is networking. You know, like somebody, ugh, I had a, a somebody say to me literally last week, so tell me, um, so who have you pitched Pride and Prejudice uh, to for Broadway? You know, the show's been out for like four years. And, yeah. I, and I, I stood there and I went, no one. And that's on me. Like, right. why haven't I pitched that show? I just haven't because I was too busy writing my next show. But you have to do both. Mm -hmm. You have to. You have to allow a couple of, you know, an hour, a half hour every day. Just do business. Like, who are you going to email today? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to cold call? Who are you going to cold email? Who are you going to research that, hey, this person might like my show? But mainly don't give up. And then the other thing I would say, and this is really important. Write what you're passionate about. Don't write what you think somebody else will like because they won't. And like... When I was a pop songwriter, the classic thing was I would be called into a meeting once every couple of weeks by my publisher, and they would like show me the song that was like, you know, top 10 on the radio or number one on the radio. And they go, write a song like this. And I go, no, it's already been I'm written. Write a song that you're going to have the next meeting and you're going to tell people to write a song like this. And that's what I did. And I had hits because I didn't listen. And I, and I just knew that you cannot write what you think people will like. The, the time to tune into the audience is when you're having a reading of your show and you wanna hear how people are responding or you're having your first production and you're in previews and you wanna know how the audience is responding. You wanna know, you wanna fix things, you wanna, now it's for them. You've already done you, now it's for them. And then if it's your first production, now, now critics are gonna are gonna weigh in. Find, don't, don't listen to, in general, don't listen to critics, but find the thread. If five critics are all saying the same thing, that's real. But you know, most of them are outliers. And then the other thing I will say about criticism, especially for musical theater, and especially if you're a composer, I'm talking to you composers now. Most people, critics, producers, even directors, they don't know music the way you do. You know, they don't have an ear for music. They know what they like, but they don't necessarily know what's good or what works. You do, if that's your job and you're good at it. You know, they do not trust that. Mm -hmm. Very few people understand music the way actual composers do. You know, I, I, there, there's, a, there's one music critic right now that I really like, and especially in pop music. I mean, if you ever read pop music criticism, they will spend 99.9% .9 of the time talking about the lyrics and not the music because they don't understand the music or it all, or, or most music is generic. So it all, oh yeah, the music's fine. And mm -hmm. I find that through Broadway as well, mm -hmm. is that most criticism of, they'll either go, oh, I couldn't hum anything, which means nothing. 
and um and then they'll just talk about the lyrics you know which is what they can understand because we can mm -hmm. all have an opinion about lyrics as and storytelling, like we can all be laymen and understand that. And we can all be laymen and understand and, and know what music we like, certainly. I mean, that's fandom, right? But in terms of professionalism and and other professionals, I'm talking to you composers still, um, you are the only one that knows or your music director knows or somebody else who's musical in your life who you trust will know. Yeah. But they chances are they do not know. Well, <laughs> I love that message of not giving up, uh, keep going. Because even as a podcaster, sometimes it, it feels like so frustrating. And it's like you have this thing you want to share with the world. And it's like, do people want to listen? And getting them to listen is, is sometimes can be really hard. Exactly, Rachel. And so my version of that is that, you know, I spend 10 years writing a musical. I film it. It looks fantastic. I'm so excited. But a 14 year old with a tennis ball is getting 14 million views and I'm getting, you know, a hundred, you know, right. yeah. so we are, we are living in a, in a current environment where we are competing with 14 year olds who know this world way better than we do. Yeah. They are way more skilled at it <laughs> because their little brains grew up like absorbing this when we did not. And, um, and so that's challenging for yeah. us as creative people and as people that want to get our work out in the world. But it's the same answer to me and you that I just said, it's just do it. It's yeah. just, you know, take whatever that half hour, hour, and just like, I'm going to just do my due diligence. But I, but I, I think probably the best thing is make friends with a 15 year old and yeah. you know, find a 15 year old that, that like thinks you're cool and, and like, yeah. you know, Wants well, to help. Because they'll be honest. Them. They'll just say it like they 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 see it. They're no artifice. Yes. No, yeah. exactly. Man, exactly. So well, you made something I really love. I I've I've told you I will I will go anywhere that's putting it on. I'm seeing it this weekend, in fact. Well, you know what? Keep me posted. Let me know how the product yeah, you send me. I will. Let I me will. know how it was. And I think I'm going to look into the hail and see if um, they'll let me watch that video. Yeah, I'll send you the like any information that I have uh, from them. But yeah, Hail Center Theater Orem because there's there's two of them. But uh, but it was very special the hail at home uh, getting to just because my my theater loving heart was broken with all with everything being closed and and yeah. uh, so to be able to see that was was really special and I I just love. I just love it so much. I mm -hmm. I think I could see it every week for the rest of my life and never get tired of it. Well, that's really awesome. So thank you for yeah. saying that. <laughs> and I want to put out there to your audience that you can see my work off, obviously on Broadway HD, but you can yes. also find my work on streamingmusicals.com okay. where you can watch Emma, Pride and Prejudice, and Sense and Sensibility. I also have a updated musical of the importance of being earnest called Being Earnest, that all takes place um, in 1964 Carnaby, England, and it and it sort of has that pop Beatles flair, but all of the wild dialogue is intact. This was a zoo musical, so it doesn't look as good as the others, but it's there to watch. And another show I, I wrote called uh, No One Called Ahead. And then a Stella Scrooge, which is my Christmas show that John Caird and I wrote, is also available to watch, even though it's not Christmas. It's real. I, I'm really proud of this musical. There hasn't uh -huh. been a production of it yet, but it's based on um, it's it's actually a Dickensian mashup. It's uh, a Christmas Carol. It is Great Expectations and Nicholas Nickleby and other Dickensian novels sort of mashed together. So I am a proponent of of putting theater on film because yeah. I believe we are losing an entire generation to the digital digital age yeah. because our industry is afraid of digital and against digital and that's bad. Yeah. Um, so I encourage everybody to uh, encourage theater and digital theater, embrace it because we need it. There's a lot yeah. of people that we forget that geographically don't live near theaters. There are people that cannot physically be in a theater or cannot get to a theater and we must pay attention to that audience, and we are not, and yeah. it's time that we do.
Yeah. I mean, I agree. I mean, even you can see it in, uh, we've had whole musicals on, uh, like, like right, the Ride of Tui musical or the Bridgerton musical, things like that, right. that have basically be, become TikTok phenomenons. So, yeah, right. it's, a, it's and, a changing and, world. And lawyers have tried to stop those and unions have tried to stop it. They are, they are doing exactly what the music industry did when MP3s became, you know, uh-huh. first yeah. the music industry sued their own customers, idiots. Then... <laughs> They tried to sue Napster and all these other companies. Right, yeah. Idiots yeah. again. And then the music business lost out to Apple. Apple took over the music industry. And then artist royalties like myself have lost royalties because the record companies were afraid of digital. And um, theater, Broadway, doing the exact same thing, making the exact same mistakes. And we're all Cassandra standing like going, do you see what's happening here? It's like, true. I mean, you look at like, I mean, Hamilton being on Disney Plus doesn't seem to hurt it one bit. No. And that's always been true. Yeah. And they don't get it. Legally Blonde. Uh, it was dying. They showed yeah, it on true. TV. Yeah. National tour. Show has never stopped making <laughs> money since then. Yeah. Like this right. is not, you know, this is not, you know, this is not brain surgery. This is just like, this is not rocket science. <laughs> phrase I was searching for. I mean, this is so obvious that our industry needs it. Anyway, well, thank you so much. It was an honor to talk with you. And thank you for making something that I really love. And you can tell John as well. I will. uh, It was a treat to talk with you and and keep us posted on, uh, on the, you know, what's going on with the, with the productions in New York. Is there anything else that's going on? Yeah. And anytime you want to jump back on and talk about any of the shows, I'm around. All right. Sounds great. <laughs> okay. Take care, Very Rachel. Good. I'd like to thank Paul for coming on the podcast. That was so much fun to get to talk with him. I really do love Daddy Long Legs. And so this was a thrill. Uh, and uh, just to get to hear about the creative process, I think it was really interesting. I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, I thought we had some good conversation about uh, just the current state of the business and Broadway and writing and everything. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you are listening on iTunes, please leave your ratings and reviews. If you are watching on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. We appreciate that so much. If there's other people you would like us to interview, just let us know. We'd love to hear that too. And uh, and make sure you check out all of our episodes uh, and share it with your friends, uh, fellow Broadway fans. We would love that. And uh, thanks again to Paul. Really appreciate it. It was a real thrill. And, uh, and you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media and uh, Rachel's Reviews Theater.com. And make sure you check out onstageblog.com. And uh, thanks so much. We'll talk to y'all later. Bye.